Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I'm your host, Diane Gibbs, and I'm joined by my super smart and beautiful sister, Vicki Gibbs. So um, anyway, I'm excited to have her on. We're going to be talking about working with family as well as I just realized I didn't put my glasses on, um, but that's okay. Um, Anyway, we're going to talk about working with family and some of the things that can be sticky about that. And then maybe some of the benefits maybe to really working with family. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Creative South because I um, gave Vicki one of my tickets this year. So she was my, um, what do you call it? Like um, my scholarship person. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And she just started her own business. So I'm really excited for her. And I think Creative South is a great place to go. Um, And so maybe you guys can chime in. And Johnny, that was your first year last year. So maybe you guys can chime in and give her some something to think about as she goes or whatever. And she's a marketer, but tell them a little bit about where you started. Because okay. it wasn't in marketing. No, nope. <coughs> no. And hey, y'all, it's, it's, it's actually a real honor to be on Diane's show. She's been doing it for a while. I'm real proud of all that she's done with it and just excited to see the interactions and all that kind of stuff. So how I got started is about as opposite of Diane, as you might imagine, like she's creative, she's artistic. And I started out as an engineer, like ones and zeros. Good at math. Numbers. Yeah. So I was always good at math growing up. And my, our father, when I went to college, he's like, I'll pay for college. But daddy was like, you can, uh, you can major in whatever you want to just make sure you can support yourself when you get out of college. So I was like, okay, well, I'm good at math. I'll go into engineering. I know I can get a job. So I started out as a hardware design engineer, so like super geek, and I really liked the creative aspect of it, Um, and I did that for five years. But when I was an engineer, the first project I worked on for two years, worked on with my mentor, got some patents out of it, it was super cool. And at the end of that, they like at work from Mitsubishi, they took it and they put it on a shelf. And I was like, well, why aren't you going to sell it? And no one could really answer my questions, and I knew there were answers. And then in the next project, um, we were designing it, and then if the customer, or supposedly the customer came, management was like, the customer wants a change. We were like, well, that's not really convenient. They were like, we need to change it. So we made the change. We go on, right, delayed it a little. Then we get to the end, and they're like, oh, by the way, that feature, yeah, the customer doesn't want it anymore. You have to take it out. And we're like, seriously? They're like, yes. I'm like, why? Again, no one could answer my questions. So again, I know there are answers to these questions. I know there must be better ways to do things. So I decided to go back to business school in part because I wanted to bridge technology and business and make sure they could speak the same language. And I also wanted to own my own business one day. So one of the things that I get really excited about is being able to convey stuff to business users and have them see the value of technology and what value it can bring to them. But then also on the technical side, help them understand the business implications for what they're doing. And all of that relates to marketing because you're having to sell internally or you're having to sell a product to people. And it's basically trying to drive behavior by trying to establish basically drive value for users right so that's just fun yeah see she's super smart anyway um and she uses words like when she was an electrical engineer i was like so what do you do all day and she's like blah 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 blah. and i could not understand whatever she said i was like what am i going to tell my friends i don't know what you do could you please speak and she was like you know i just wanted her to say it normal but she's even when she worked at some of the places, I think she needed that technology kind of background to be able to do the kind of marketing you do so well. Right. Thanks. I think part of it. Yes. I think it also it gives me some credibility to the technical side of the house. And then I can also because sometimes I, someone just wrote um, the, the client ain't always right, which is totally true. But sometimes the client doesn't understand why what they're asking for is really hard. And so from a technology perspective, by understanding the technology side, I can try to convey to them why it may not be the best way they've asked for, and then try to give them an alternative where they can achieve their goal. And it's also better on the technology side. And you're also, um, one thing I, I, what you've helped me with recently is I just want to keep creating things. I just want to, oh, I just want to make this. And she's like, you need to actually push this out. The one thing you have made, you need to push it out and you need to make it. And I'm like, but that's not fun. You know, I want to make some new things. And that's, um, that is one of the reasons I think we work 
really well together. And I know Kim, you're in here and Kim actually sent us an email or me an email today. And I thought it was so good. And I actually um, read it to Vicki. So I'm going to um, sort of skim it and read it, but I think it was all pretty safe. Maybe Kim, you can write in the chat if you don't want us to read it out loud. And I'll go with another question first to Vicki. <laughs> So uh, Johnny does a lot of social media as well. He's a podcaster. Oh, cool. He's a designer. He's a uh, art director. You know. Um, oh, nice. So uh, okay. So Kim says I can do it. So he says anyone can learn marketing slash integrated circuit board, three D modeling, matrix engineering is not for all brains. Absolutely. Um, knowing what it takes to produce makes you a better designer. Ab absolutely. Especially like with coding and web stuff, it's really good to have a little bit of an idea of what it takes mm -hmm. and know what you can't do, you know, and Hey, I don't right. know how long this is going to take. I need to talk to somebody before I give you a quote. And our mom's here too, just so you know, she's the green egg. <laughs> she doesn't know how to do the profile picture. <coughs> anyway. Um, all right. So I'm going to read Kim's email, which I think is really Pretty neat. So um, she's been working with her sister for over a year now. We're extremely close. So it's a thin line for me. We went through a rough patch when deciding how, how to handle payment, if and when we'd work for free because we're sisters, and how much time and effort we would contribute to each other's projects. It's been a challenge, but the rewards are worth it. She's incredibly talented and and when on the job, we are, we work seamlessly. I barely have to tell her what I need because she finishes my thoughts slash sentences. I trust her opinion both creatively and personally, and there's no one else I'd rather travel with. So her advice was create strict, professional, and fair guidelines early on. It may not be fun, but it's better to hash it out and move on. So what do you think about that, Vicki? And just what do you think? Well, so I think one of the advantages that Kim hit on, which is really key. So if you're sisters, you obviously know each other well because you've known each other your whole life, which means you know what people are, what your sister's good at and you know what your sister's maybe not good at. And that works on both sides, right? So you can help kind of fill in the gaps. I know that one of the things that works well with Diane and I is that we are very different. And so we complement each other well. And I would imagine from what Kim said is that she and her sister probably complement each other well too. So what like, I'm not as creative and don't have as creative an eye, but I know if I'm working with a client, I know who can solve their problem. It's Diane, right? I think another key is the trust factor. Like I know that if I ask Diane to do something, she's going to give it 110%. And I know that she's going to work it until it's to a point where she's satisfied with it, you know? And so having that level of trust that she's going to produce good work is something that I feel really good about and bringing to my clients because there's really no one else that I would rather work with because I know that in my opinion, she's the best. So um, I think the other thing that Kim brought up is like coming up with what that business relationship is. Um, Diane and I have always, if we do stuff for each other's business, we'll do it for free, um, which has worked out great because as we're both doing our business, you know, we're trying to help each other out, help each other be successful. Um, but it's also what comes with free is that in the level of priorities with paying clients, we're generally down here, you know, so sometimes things may take longer or whatever. So you just need a level of patience and understanding and ex as it relates to that. Expectations. And I think if you, yeah. if you don't have clear expectations, like, oh my gosh, I thought you were going to give me that logo, or I thought you were mm -hmm. going to look over this thing that I was working on, Vicki, you know, whatever. And if, you know, I just, we usually tell each other timelines. Well, when do you think you'll mm -hmm. be able to get that? And if mm -hmm. I can work it in, it, she knows that she's going to be below paying clients, but, um, but I also want to do something for her because I know it helps her get her feet off the ground. Right. Anyway. Yeah. And, and vice versa. And the other thing is like, so I have a business partner that I work with now and who was also in my last business. And Jeff has worked with Diane on some occasions. And like, I know how like, to sort of translate Diane talk sometimes because sometimes it might not be clear because Jeff's also very technical and he'd be like, what did she mean by that? Or he may need to tell something to her and I can give him advice for how to like put that in terms that Diane can clearly understand. So also just that understanding when you're bringing other people in to work with your sister, I think makes it, you, we can move a lot faster, right? It may take longer to get stuff done because there's clients ahead but we can probably cycle through, you know, iterations and stuff like that a lot more quickly because we do understand each other better. Right. What do you think, Diane? Anything else to add? Um, 
uh, you know, it's not just about sisters. It could be also be siblings, any siblings. So J uh, Johnny says, can confiding like a sister slash brother be damaging to the project? Because you might say things to your family um, that you wouldn't say to a peer. So I'm going to answer that one. So there are okay. times that I have to treat Vicky like a client because I would not, I would, not, I would say different things to my sister, <laughs> but she'll kind of be, uh, she can be kind of short with me and she's taller than me, <laughs> <laughs> but she, I just am like, she's your client. She's your client. And so I think you have to kind of have that. And so I normally as a sister, I would just rah, back at her. But when she's in that client role, I don't, I say, oh, okay, so sorry. And sometimes like, you know, on the phone, you're kind of short sometimes. I mean, even when you're not being like peer, right. you know, client talk, she's like, I gotta go, I gotta go pick up my dog or whatever. Right. <clears throat> so that's my introverted side and you're extroverted. <laughs> I mean, there uh, we've definitely had um, times when our we communicate differently, and it um, it's our needs. And now I think we understand people better. But that you know, she was four year, three years, but four grades older than me. And so when she was a freshman in college, I was a freshman in high school. And so you know, as she's graduating college. I was still in because I did five years at Auburn um, for five football seasons. I mean, so here's the thing, like Vicky went to Duke, you know, non SEC school. I remember, you know, they just crazy things. I just think there are, you need to understand. And it, it may not, it may be that you are really close in high school or something. And then you go through a period of time. And I also think like Kim is, um, uh, pretty um she's graduated just a few years ago and so um i and leah i think leah and they're both creative so they're uh, maybe a little bit more similar i don't know mm -hmm. uh, but and war eagle amy amy went to auburn also <coughs> but um so vicky's a huge george fan because that's where my parents went to school so mm -hmm. um anyway um but i think that sometimes there may be more conflict in the beginning. And now we've been working together for probably, I'd say 10 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. More so probably within the past five or six, but yeah. When was on, Envy? Okay. Envy, yep, yeah, was, we opened in 2005. So yes, yeah, so that's 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that it has to do with, um, with time. I don't think you're going to come out of the gate and right. be like uh, able to do everything. But I think what Kim said was having kind of like a contract or having like a understanding. I think it's about expectations and mm -hmm. having those from the get go of, but I think that now it's kind of like, um, it, it, it's, it's different and things are always changing. Usually Vicky's always had a job job and then I've just done been a contractor for her job job and then now she's doing her own thing, which I'm so excited because I think she's wicked smart. And so I think she's going to be able to help a lot more people that way. So anyway, I anyway. So she said um, the, another one of Kim's questions, which I think is really good. Um, um, how do you handle the finances of working with and for family? I think we've covered that. Um, I've always well, worked. Let, let, let me sort of touch that. I don't, you and I did when we were talking earlier, but I don't know that we said it here. So okay. for each other, we do things for free. Like if I'm doing stuff for Little Bird, if she's doing stuff for Marlo, which is my new consulting business. <laughs> but when we bring, when I bring her in for a client, client work, um, she charges me. And so then I charge the client. So she's getting, you know, her market rates for that. And there are times when she's given me like the friends and family discount. And I think it's a matter of having those conversations about what those rates are, when you would do a friends and family versus when you would not do that, when I'm able to discount her, when I'm not. And all of that is just what you would do with any contractor that you would work with. And again, I think it goes back to what Diane said is all about expectations. And, and it's okay because I want her to be able to eat and she wants me to be able to eat. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it's just, you know, and that's the one great thing about working with family because you, hopefully you both love each other and you want what's best. So we're going to, I mean, I think some families aren't like that, right? I guess I, we want each other to be successful. Right. So anyway, um, 
So, okay. Uh, and awesome, Matthew. I can't wait to hear your questions. Just type them in. Um, so offering family discounts, um, I do offer a family discount. And granted, things that are just for Vicki are free um, for her business. Um, and then I do offer her a, a reduced rate, even if it's working for one of her clients. And she'll let me know beforehand, up front. Okay. Um, so... I am going, so uh, Johnny says he gives 15% off. I don't know. I'm so bad with math. I, mean, we just I think it's a 25, rate. yeah, I think it's a 25% discount is. to be honest. It is. Yeah. I was saying, yeah. Um, okay. I'm trying to um, get some of these off of, okay. Okay. Anyway. <clears throat> um, okay. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Here we go. So you've done a lot of work in the, on the internet, like not on, well, you, whatever with internet based companies. Right. Okay. So she worked for art.com. She worked for, uh, after grad school, you stayed in the same area. You went to UNC, um, Chapel Hill mm -hmm. for your MBA. And, um, so what was interesting to you about that kind of area? Oh, about, Not di about digital. Yeah, digital. So the thing that was awesome about digital, and so I got involved, the company that I worked for right after B school was OpenSight Technology, and we were open software or auction software. And I started there in 1998. So I was in, in the internet software business, like during the internet bubble. And that was times when like you'd go to internet world and like there was just crazy stuff. Like they would spend, companies would spend a ton of money on booze and it was just, it was awesome to be in the middle of that. Um, and our company ended up getting sold to Siebel Systems, so it had a successful exit. But a lot of companies just spent a ton of money and closed. So it was kind of a crazy time because no one actually had to generate revenue or profits necessarily, which, you know, that's not going to work long term. Um, and so that's why you had the bubble bust. But it was really fascinating just to see all the creativity come online. So prior to, like, everything exploding on the Internet, it would take a really long time to get a product to market, to get people to adopt it and everything else. And even like with the auction software that I sold, like we sold it on a disc that people would have to install on their servers. And so then you fast forward to things via the internet and you could just download it or use software as a service now and all that kind of stuff. And what that means is that there's a lot quicker iteration for seeing those technology changes. There's also, if you think about the fact that it would take, you know, a year to get a product to market, now you can actually get like an application into an app store, you know, in less than three months. You can get it out there for market validation. You can test different features. So your ability to not just guess what the market wants, but to actually be able to test what the market wants is a lot higher now. I think for that reason, you see a lot more stuff, but not everything is successful, which is why you have such a long tail. But to me, that's it means people are being creative and you can see what people are doing. Like, I think people are always being creative, but their ability to get it to market and their ability for people to know what it was just wasn't there without the communication channels that we have now. So some people might not know what long tail is. So could you explain that term? Oh, sure. So it's like, so when you do this, <laughs> like, let's say you're searching for something on, and you go to Google and you search for like our dad really loves history. So let's say you're, you're searching for something on um, George Washington's biography. So you're gonna get a whole list of things, like you'll get Wikipedia probably comes up first. You're gonna get Amazon that probably comes up with different book options and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's the first page of results, right? So that is the majority of things that people are gonna care about. The long tail, as I deem it, is basically if you go down at the bottom, you'll see that you know there's multiple pages of search results, like it goes on into infinity. The long tail is like everything past page like three or four. And that applies not only to search results, but it also applies to popularity as it relates to, um, say, iPhone applications, you know, Android applications, as it relates to book titles. You have your New York Times bestsellers. You have all of these things. So when you talk about content, anything related to content as it relates to, you know, um, even TV shows and all that kind of stuff, you talk about long tail content. And there's a lot that, that's where your niche players are in those long tails to where you may not have a ton of people there. 
but the people that are engaged in that locktail content are probably engaged with it for longer. And so there's different advantages to leveraging those content or search results or et cetera. Yep. So Johnny mentioned tribes. Yep. Right. Seth Godin, right? Or yep. Chris Brogan. They are both tribe people. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think for me, teaching design, I try to pull, mom just gave you, these are yeah, like, you. you know, yeah, she's trying to make them even probably. <laughs> um, thanks, mom. She doesn't love either one of us more, but every time she calls for Vicky, she says, die, Vicky. Isn't that terrible? She always tells her to die. So I am the favorite. She's just, you know. Anyway, I'm Vic Diane. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, um, but one of the things that I really like about knowing somebody in marketing, granted, knowing my sister, I mean, I would ask anybody because I'm not the smartest person on the whatever. You it know? doesn't have to do with smart. You're just not shy. That's fine. Right. <laughs> but I'm going to ask because I want to learn uh, if something is. So if you are, feel like, oh, gosh, I'm going to look like an idiot. I don't know what they're talking about. Um, then you just you just need to ask because that's actually going to be better, but it's good to know somebody who understands that kind of business side of it so that you can be better for your clients because some of them don't know anything about this at all. A lot of them, and they don't have a marketing person in there or they don't have somebody that was trained to do some of those things. And Vicky knows a lot about testing or a, a lot about SEO or a lot about other things. And so it's good to have somebody that you can talk to so that you can focus, I guess, well, your client stuff. Yeah. So I've given a presentation actually to some of the groups that I mentor for startups. And it's it's a marketing strategy presentation, but it's called the black box of marketing because a lot of whether they're your clients or whether they're people in general, they don't really know what marketing is. And so they think, oh, it's a flyer or it's a website or it's an ad it's and those are marketing tactics but when you think about marketing you really have to take it a step back and talk about marketing strategy which goes back to what value do, do you deliver to your customers who are your customers you're going to have different customer personas that are going to value your product differently and then understanding who your competition is so you need to understand all of that before you even start with the tactics and so being able to take that step back with your clients is super important and as a designer, if you don't ask those questions, then you're just kind of like, um, it's kind of like the 90s and the internet. You're just kind of doing it for fun, maybe. And so, it, right? Because you're just, yes, it's like you're throwing it up against the wall and seeing what sticks. And sometimes you need to do that. But being slightly more targeted but based on who you know your customer to be is probably a good idea. And sometimes um, the client has an idea of who their client is, but then it's not really realistic of who their uh, client is, or they want to be somewhere else. They want to do, you know, um, 20 year olds, but really it's a 14 year old that's buying their product. You know, it, it's important to be realistic and, and mm -hmm. test some things. And that's where marketing can really, or having, knowing somebody there can really help you. Right. Yep. Okay. We're going to go on to question um, three, you give a lot, you give back a lot. I was thinking you give a lot of feedback is what I thought in my head, but that's not what I wrote. And you do give good feedback. Um, but sometimes when we, so when you're, Kim was asking us about like how we, or she wasn't, but we started talking about how we communicate. Sometimes I'll just be like, well, I'm not really sure, you know? And um, when we, she started this company with Jeff now. So I was like, well, can we just have a Slack channel? And I don't know if you'd use Slack, have you before, Vicky? Yeah, I, I hadn't before, but I love it. I'm so glad we're but, using it. But Jeff had. And so this way I can communicate with both of them at the same time. I can share documents, whatever. Um, but I know that there are certain things that um, Jeff doesn't understand or I'm like, uh, can I call you? Because I'm confused. <clears throat> and Amy loves Slack as well. Um, no problem being late, Fabio. Just glad you're here. Um, so, all right. So you you do give back a lot. So I think, I really think as a designer, it's important to do some pro bono work and to have your foot in the community. Or, you know, for us, it could be in the design community a little mm -hmm. bit more as a whole. It could be physically in your 
Raleigh Durham area. Mm -hmm. um, but for you, you really have, you've had a, a one company. Is that all? I don't know what the question is yet. So I can't tell you what the answer okay. is. I said, have you had, you've had one company. That's a question. Oh, that like, that was mine. Like NB. Yeah, right. Or, is that well, the only company? Well, and then I ran Albright Digital, but someone else owned it. Right. Right. But so that's two companies. One you owned, owned. Okay. Um, okay. So you've done a lot. You've given back. What kinds of things have you done and do you do? And why is this important to you? So I think there's two different sides that you're trying to get to. One is giving back pro bono. I'm going to try to interpret. <laughs> so, I mean, one is giving back pro bono. Like some of the things that one of the things I'm really passionate about just growing up as a woman in technology is helping other young women succeed in technology and just helping to bring awareness to diversity in general, whether that's gender, race or whatever. So um, I helped start an organization called SoarTriangle.com. And it's around um, our focus goal is around closing the funding gap for female entrepreneurs. And it's something that it takes time, but it's also really fun. And um, we're having a big event on March 31st. So anyone in Raleigh would love for you to come. It's that morning. And um, so those are the types of things that I do. And I do because I love it. And because I really feel like for everyone, whatever current generation you are, whoever you are, you didn't get there just on your own. You got there because other people helped you along the way. And I do think it's part of, you know, those people paid it forward to you. And I think it's incumbent upon us to pay forward to others and to help them and to, you know, make sure we're shepherding them in the right way because there's a lot of people out there that give bad advice. So hopefully we can be the ones to give them good advice. And um, paying it forward, I think, always reaps benefits down the line, even if it's just watching someone who you've mentored or talked to be successful. Like that to me is, is just, um, I love watching that. Um, on the other side, as far as how to do it smartly as it relates to business is, you know, network where you think your target customers are. And part of that is, I think, what Diane said about learning, because if you're talking to people who are more experienced than you are, who have experience outside of your area of expertise, people who are in just interest areas for you, you know, um, go to network events where they might be, invite them to lunch, invite them to coffee. Like I have a number of people who I kind of have on my like circuit who I will meet up with every three to four months for lunch or coffee or a drink. And we'll just catch up and chat about what's going on. And sometimes things come out of that. Sometimes they don't, but I'll always learn something. And so that's something that I can take back and adds to the value that I can bring or a connection I could make for someone or what have you. Um, for example, one of the clients that I actually had back in December, January, it came from a contact that I built a relationship with over the past five years. And then she forwarded me a lead for someone who needed help in my type of expertise area. So you just never know when it's going to come, but there's always something to take out of those conversations. So networking is key. It's also important for you to find the networking that works for you. So like Diane's very extroverted. I'm more introverted. So like walking into like a network event where I don't know anyone, not super comfortable for me. So I usually do things. I'll do networking events, but it's usually with in groups of people that I know at least a few people. And I like to do this kind of one on one things. But like for Diane, like she's super comfortable in like large groups of people where she doesn't know anyone and she can get a ton. She'll meet a ton of people in those kind of things. So I think you also have to be just understand yourself and understand how you can be successful and set yourself up for success. Because, you know, if you just try to do, say, what Diane did, that might not work for you. If you do what I do, that might not work for you. So you have to find out what the right combination is for you. You have to find your superpower. <laughs> Vicki gave me this. So I believe everybody has their own superpower. Can you read that regular or is it backwards? Yeah. Nope, you okay. can read it regular backwards for me. <clears throat> anyway, it's on my desk. Good. So what, one thing I love about working with Vicki is that she'll give me things that I don't, haven't always done before. Um, she'll be like, you can do this. And I'm like, uh, okay, I'll try. You know, and I think it's having that somebody believing in you because sometimes with a regular client, they wouldn't, um, they would be like, well, do you, have you ever done any web design or have you ever done any UX or you know, UI or you have you done an app design or social media? And it's like, that's how I think we stay current or for me as a professor and as a designer, I stay current and I find things that I really like and 
a lot of things that I've done, I've done the first time I did for Vicky on something. Um, like some of the pull up banners that I did for you at mm -hmm. Albright. Um, you know, and I, I just, I think it's about having clients that doesn't necessarily have to be that your sibling is your client, but it could be just a client that you trust and that trusts you and that believes that you can do other things. And they're like, how about this? Could you do this? And, you know, you may have done it really under budget because you didn't had never done that before. But I also think it's important, even if it's not a sibling to, for them to, um, you know, they really believe in you and you just, you're maybe I can do that. Let me look into it. And it's not, I think what you're saying too, is like not your boundaries are not fixed. And I think especially in today's world, there's all different kinds of medium for content and messaging and everything else. And part of it is pulling back, pulling it back to, okay, what is the message? What is the audience and how are they digesting the message? And then how can you creatively get them to do whatever action you're trying to get them to do? And if you're focused, that's what you focus on as a designer, right? At any point in time. And so it's just a matter of taking that to whatever medium is appropriate. And I do think challenging yourself because also in understanding what your client wants and what customer they're trying to target, push them on what, what that customer does. Like whenever I work with clients on customer personas and what they do, like, well, what do they do? And they're like, well, they work in the business and I want them to buy this. And I'm like, but what do they do outside of the business? Like as people, you know, like, are they generally in what age group? Are they active? Are they sedentary? Do they like, are they healthy? You know, and try to get a, try getting to get around sort of what surrounds them in their world. And that'll also help you work with your client as far as how to target. Um, someone, it may have been Johnny at said something earlier about his favorite question. It's like, why are you spending money on this project? It's usually some lofty goal. And so trying to get them to sort of narrow it down, it's like, okay, in which area? So you want them to buy where, how much, you know, which customers, all of that kind of stuff. Helping them noodle that out is going to help you just be more targeted and help them, but also help them trust you to Diane's point. And then they're going to be, well, like, I want to target this customer base, but I don't know how. So instead of being very directive, they're going to be more free flowing because they'll trust you because you've worked with them through some of those problems. Right. OK. Um, so you've also worked for a lot of startups. So one of the companies, I don't know if this was open site or this was a different one, uh, but it was those two kids that were in from, they were in high school and they'd gotten like, Ten was that? that became Metro city. Yep. They okay. went to North Carolina school. Of Saint Smith. Oh, they, Oh, uh, for high school. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she worked for these guys. So they couldn't buy beer, but they were her bosses. Right. And they were, um, I'm sure that you never bought any beer for them, no, but I um, didn't. oh, really? Hmm. Um, all right. So sometimes, um, sometimes you have worked for a lot of startups, and sometimes they need design work. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, here you know what my one of my biggest fears is um, of you going to Creative South is that the bubble of that Diane is great is going to be busted. But I think it's worth it because I think you're going to enjoy Creative South so much because <laughs> everybody's really, really good. Well, so. Dan, yeah, well can I uh, address that fear first? So by the way, <coughs> I do think you are the best designer that, and like, I do truly believe that. And like, but, I, it's, it's, but it's not like I just look at your design. I live in, in a world where I see design everywhere. Right. Yeah. But you don't see mine everywhere. Well, that's because you're not, Cus they're not all those people aren't your customers. My point is, is I know you do great design and we work well together. And that's 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 part of it is that whole process and the outcome, which I do think is awesome. Right. And so Kent saying from what you had said before uh, to get whom to do what yes. instead of what because of why is what I yeah. is is what I use. And I think that's really smart, Kent, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, your job as you pay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Johnny said it might be <laughs> awkward. Yes. Um, your child boss. I mean, it wasn't like Vicky was that old. I mean, you were like in 25 or 20. No, they were. So Judd, when I worked for Judd, I was 19 when I first started and I was 31. I mean, but that, did, that never bothered me. I think that bothers other people, but it's like I view everything as a team. 
like everyone has different roles. Everyone has different value to add in different ways. And Chad and I always had a mutual respect. So it was never an issue. Right. And he was wicked smart. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So why did you choose to work with me, I guess, rather than somebody else in your area? Because sometimes that's a, a lot. I mean, we do not live close together. He, she lives in North Carolina and I live in Alabama. Um, and we've never lived, I mean, except when we were kids, we, but we didn't have jobs then, thankfully. So why did I choose to work with you? I mean, to be honest, it's because I trusted you. I knew you do good work and I didn't know anything about graphic design. So I didn't even know how to evaluate. So I knew you were good. I could see what you did was good. I liked it. There's other stuff I saw that I didn't like. Okay. Like I like her. I know that she's not going to tell me I'm an idiot for asking stupid questions. And I know that you would provide me the right <laughs> guidance. So it, a lot of it has to do with trust. Right. And also knowing that you could take me through the process and teach me the process without becoming incredibly frustrated. Oh, right. I'm sure right. you did, but you didn't let me know. No. Um, you probably get frustrated with me more than I get frustrated with you. I'm like, what was that again? Um, cause she ends up telling me the same thing a lot and it's just, she's like, you keep listening to other people. Why don't you get your uh, product out of the closet? Right. Th th this is about her finding your superpower that she won't right. want. <laughs> anyway, I have to adjust it. Okay. Um, so have you ever, we have a really large family. My mom is one of 11 and so she's number 10. And so we have a lot of cousins and, um, so have you ever worked with any of our other cousins or anybody no. else? No, okay. I haven't. And part of it is, I mean, so David and I, so David's here. He's a year older than me. Um, David? Got, no, he's Mary? a year younger than me. I was like, he's not older than you. He's a year younger than me. He's, it, I mean, it doesn't really matter at this point. He's one or two years, whatever. He's um, younger than you. Right. So he's anyway. younger than that. he's married. He's got two kids. They're all awesome. So he and I will get together on a semi-regular basis and just talk business. Like I'll ask him what's going on with him. And he has a great network of people here. He's in sales for IBM and he just, he's a great networker and knowledgeable about lots of stuff. So he and I got together a couple of weeks ago. And so, and he'll like give me, like he's connected me with some people, which has been great. Um, so he and I, while we haven't worked directly together, we kind of help each other out in that way. Um, and I would have to say that most of our family is, uh, they probably don't understand what you or I really do because we've had so many jobs. And so I don't even know if they would understand <coughs> each with us about anything. I mean, that's just, I mean, I even think like mama and daddy forgot trying to remember the name of the company I worked for because I had had so many jobs. So um, and it's not like she gets fired. She just gets oh, bored and moves bored. on. Yeah. And it's not like it's like three months. It's like three years or two years. Right. Right. I mean, she's not flaky, but it might look like that on paper. <laughs> yeah. My I've made up a lot of job descriptions, too, which is fun. So Johnny says that his wife, so one of my friends, too, mm -hmm. Stacy, um, she's a marketing person and she went to Creative South last year. She thought Creative South was great to hear innovative entrepreneurs find their own markets, self-promotion tactics, and a lot of leadership messages. Oh, cool. So I, to me, it, it's very, in, a lot of inspiring stories. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's just nice to see somebody else who's done it or mm -hmm. who's struggling through it. And then you can co-commiserate with them, I guess. Yeah. And so I think for me, I can't wait for you and Tara both to kind of have that experience. So um, I wasn't going to bring this up, but I'll, because it makes me look bad. So, but I'm going to tell it because I don't really care. <clears throat> so I, um, well, I hiked the Grand Canyon when I was uh, 22, I think, with a whole bunch of friends. And, um, uh, and it was uh, one of the best experiences in my life. And I love Arizona and I would love to live there one day. Um, and I love uh, just the way the dirt looks, you know. So I said, oh, you know, for my 40th birthday, I would really like to go hike the Grand Canyon again. And I really wanted Vicky to be able to go and experience this. And Vicky's not like, I mean, she is way athletic, way more than me. But she was always a little kind of like I had more coordination, I think, mm -hmm. than you as a kid. Um, 
and, and also so, the fear of heights. Yeah. Well, I don't have that. Um, so she, so she said yes. And so Tara uh, was, who's my best friend. She um, is also coming to Creative South for the first time. She lives in Denver. And so we met and Tara's a year younger than me. And so we did it on Tara's for 40th. And so I was 44, 44, uh, 41. Anyway, so um, I was like making fun of my sister with my mom for having these like hiking sticks, you know, and I was like, oh, whatever, you know, she's had knee surgery, maybe she needs, but she plays soccer like three nights a week. Okay. Like with boys and she can handle, and she's like, when you see her, she just doesn't even cast a shadow. She's like, I'm kind of bulky and she's like a stick. <clears throat> so anyway, so we're going and I'm like, oh my goodness, my knees are killing me. Um, walking that, I mean, cause it's, I'm really pretty short and she's taller than me, but so there were big steps, you know, going down. So her and Tara really just take off and they're going and, you know, and she gave me one of her poles. So I had a pole and she had a pole and then she bought me poles at the bottom. And then I had my own poles, thankfully. And they were really helpful. So don't make fun of people who use poles when they're hiking. <laughs> so anyway, um, it, it became this um, internal kind of struggle for me. I kept going. I was kept walking, but I was much more out of shape than they were. Even though I practice in Mobile, there's not, you know, you're not going the elevations. And yeah, pretty flat. So um, for me, they would be way up ahead. I couldn't see them. And so I was really glad that they got to spend time together. But this whole like beautiful world that I had painted, that it was going to be the three of us and my favorite place in the whole world, you know, Grand Canyon. And I realized it was just this really, I had a, um, I had a, it was a really good time for me and God, I guess, because it was me, me. And then I would get up to them and I was ready. I was walking the whole time, but they were resting and they were like, okay, well, let's keep going. And I'm like, wait, I need to sit down. And I had told Vicky to get new shoes. I was like, you need to get new shoes. And I had bought, I had my, these Rakeley boots that are leather and they're thick and heavy. Great for winter hiking. And, um, and I had them resold and everything had them. I was like, I got my shoes. I did not wear those the first time in, uh, I wore some nice, thinner, lighter boots. And um, I ended up putting on my something other shoes for the next day. I think I had some tennis shoes or something. But I had all these plans of what we would do. I was like, I'll be able to make it. I can do a, a seven mile in, uh, you know, I think I did it in Mobile in maybe an hour and a half, two hours. Maybe it was, I mean, you know, hiking full pack was walking around. I was like, we, I'll be able to, we'll be able to get to the bottom and I'm going to be able to watercolor. I had brought watercolors. I don't know why. Anyway, it was crazy. I had to have a donkey carry my stuff up the next day. So it was incredibly, um, uh, humbling, embar humbling. Yes. Embarrassing, humbling, whatever. So to me, the the fact that Tara and Vicky are also both coming to Creative South um, for the first time. And I usually go alone and I'm fine with that. Um, but I, you know, it, I'm glad that they have each other because I think I'm going to be busy doing volunteer stuff. So we'll be fine. Can I um, can I make another uh, observation or comment on your story? Sure. So I think there are a couple lessons in that. And one is that just because you've done something before this relates to work and life and all of that kind of stuff, it doesn't mean it's always going to be the same the second time. And that sometimes you have to listen to others when they may have opinions. Um, like Tara and I tried to talk to Diane a year before the trip and was like, you need to be walking. You need to be walking a lot. You need to get in shape. And, um, but she was, she thought that because she was the only one that had done it, that she knew everything. And so I think one of the things in that is that, and then Tara and I also though, like we may have been ahead, but we also supported you. We took stuff, oh, yeah. we took stuff out of her pack. we carried it down. We got, um, I was like, we took the water and Which those was boots. We had, yeah, but that was out. right, right, right. So, right. Come, and coming down. So I guess it's a matter of, you know, making sure you listen to others, your expectation that not everything is always going to be the same, 
but also that no matter like sometimes if someone if something happens to someone if you love them you're also still there to support them no matter what and that we all i mean it was an accomplishment for us all i mean that was literally the most physically exhausted i'd ever been after 25 miles up and down and all that kind of stuff and it stretched my boundaries i think one of the things expectation wise is that i was probably a lot more prepared just because i'm not a camper i don't like sleeping outside but there's not a bathroom available not super comfortable for me um but i did it and diane convinced me it would be awesome and it was and so there's also trust there you know so trusting that but then also i did research i talked to people talked to a lot of people about the poles about the shoes about um supplements to eat on the way to make sure i had energy and so a lot of times we prepare better when we're doing something new as opposed to when we're doing something that we think we already know and so right. because our world changes so much now with whether it's technology or what have you it's always good to have people that you can check in with and that you'll trust their opinion um to sign a kind of level set with what you make what you already know and just to make sure you're on the right track right absolutely so you're going to creative south for the first time um and I've told you a lot about it because I mm-hmm. love it. So what kind of things are you looking forward to? And one of my fears is that you're just going to work. Like you're going to go to this, uh, the Iron Bank, which is a cool little bank. Uh, I'm not a bank. It's a coffee shop. But I guess it used to be a bank. And you're just going to stay there and you're going to work the whole time. That's my fear. Oh, I won't do that. Um, so I may not be like, I'm. so what I'm excited about doing is kind of seeing things through your eyes um, and seeing what you've been talking about. I also, I love to learn. So I I am definitely going to like go to different sessions, take in different input, see different, all um, all those things. Huh? It's all one big session. Like you could just go and you experience with everybody else. You don't have to pick. Oh, thank goodness. Picking is really hard. Um, So I'm really excited about all of that and just learning and the environment. And one of the things that you said you've gotten out of it is not only the sessions, but also the conversations that you have with people around it. So I'm looking forward to that as well. And just seeing something that you thought was awesome because you're, you've always talked about it being, you know, it's what recharged you before you had this, right? And you would go every, once a year and you would like come back super excited and, um, you know, ready to, you know, do it all over again and all these new ideas. And so the fact that it stimulates that amount of creativity and rejuvenation, I think just as I'm really looking forward to that. And so I don't necessarily have any preconceived expectations other than I just want to go with an open mind and kind of see where it takes me. And I do think it seems like it's a bridge between the creative side, you know, there's the social side, there's the spiritual side, there's um, the leadership, and there's all of these different things coming together that make it really interesting. So, I mean, and I've even talked to some people about it. So there, I have this group that I started meeting with once a month that this guy got together. It's um, founders and basically people in leadership positions within um, startups. It's like five of us who are also, um, spiritual as well and so kind of talking about like challenges in the business and all that kind of jazz and i told them about creative because some of them are creatives and they were really interested too so um yeah so i'm just excited about experiencing it so um i'm still looking for volunteers if anybody and it's a deeply discounted ticket but you work for four to six hours and um so i'm excited so one of the things um it's For me, it's different than another design conference because you're going and you're all experiencing the same thing. I mean, unless you didn't go to a session, right? The the talk or whatever. Um, So I'm I'm excited for you to make some connections or um, help some people or talk to some people about some things because I think that there are there's uh, some UX people that go. There are definitely Mm -hmm. some entrepreneurs that go. um, Entrepreneurs of some bigger companies uh, or medium sized companies, I guess. And I think seeing some things and there's also people from all over the world, um, which I'm excited to show that part too. And people just are, they were silly and funny and um, that's always nice too. Um, So it's a, a, big year for me there because I'm head of volunteers, which I'm already having anxiety about and waking up in the middle of the night like, oh, no, I don't have enough volunteers Um, because I would like to be able to hear some things. And I am Mm -hmm. speaking, so I kind of need to be there then. Um, And so um, 
that's kind of a, you know, it'll work out. I do know it'll work out, but, um, you know, I think when I went, I didn't know if I would, cause I went completely not knowing anybody. I actually found out about creative South. I'm pretty sure because of Sarah, who is right. If you look right there, she, mm -hmm. um, told me about it on design recharge. And then oh. she said, Oh, well, have you heard of this conference? Cause she had been the year before. And then I interviewed Mike before I went up there. And then I volunteered that first, um, that first year, just, you know, registration or whatever, whatever I could do. So to me, it, um, it's like, uh, this, and I think Amy, you probably feel this way and, and anybody else who's gone, there is a, there's just a spirit kind of about, and people are just, uh, Mike has this thing. You will definitely get hugged by Mike and, um, Mike is super great. His wife, Karen, is super great. And everybody I met was just really nice and they weren't so superficial. They were really genuine. Mm -hmm. And um, workshops to me were really, a, I got to meet Bob Ewing and Drew Hill and I didn't know who they were and they didn't know who I was. And it was terrific um, because I, you know, we were all kind of growing at the same time. You're everybody's in different places. Uh, but I think to me, um, that's one thing I like about the workshops because you get two hours with these people and, and it's not like you're like sharing your life story, maybe at, at your workshop, but you're like, I had to tell them that I was not a, a very good illustrator. And cause it was like, it was like Bob and Jana Barrett who are both letterers. And it was like, you were let you're sitting around the table and it, one person was going to letter something and the next person was going to draw it. And then the next person. And, and it was kind of like uh, the, you remember the telephone game, game telephone? Yeah. When you're a kid. And so you, nobody heard the same thing, but you were supposed to be able to visually communicate it on the, at the end. Anyway, it was terrible. I did terrible. I feel bad for Bob because he was on the other side of me and he's like, I'm not sure what that is. And it was like, it, it was terrible. It was like a pirate preacher or something. It was, it was, it was bad. And I'm sure he was like, Oh, I'm sure she doesn't have any work or whatever. I'm like, I'm better on a computer. But <clears throat> anyway, um, it was funny because now both of those people, Jana and Bob, Bob's been on the show a bunch of times and Jana's been on definitely. Um, but they both, I've seen them grow. And so it's the relationships I've been able mm -hmm. to make and the friendships I've been able to make. And I'm excited for you and Tara and anybody else who's new. I was excited for Johnny to be able to go. I think the first year I was going to go, he's like, is it really worth it? And I remember you sending me uh, that on Facebook or something, uh, Johnny. And then I was like, yes. And I hadn't even been, but I could already tell because of the conversations I had had with Mike mm -hmm. and Peter and some other people that I knew it was going to be really good. And then when uh, I think Johnny totally, he had a, a, a great um, experience last year, him and Stacy, And then C loved it. <clears throat> um, but I guess, you know, for people, what I tell my students as well, I'm like, you guys don't need to just go to lunch with each other. Right. Like you need to make new friends. And I think you and Tara are both kind of more introverted. So, so we can, we can be together and meet new people. Yeah. So that'll be good because <laughs> I feel a little bad. So, um, I know Tara doesn't watch these, so I'm going to tell you. So her birthday, everybody else can help me with this. Maybe her birthday is on the seventh and that's going to be a really pretty stressful day because it's the workshop day for me. And the workshops are at two different locations, which that's never happened. Um, so you're going to go to the Springer and you're going to register and you're going to see Steve probably and some other people. And then we're going to take you on a golf cart to whatever location you're going to. So oh, I'm super excited about driving a golf cart because I love to mow. So it'll be super fast. We're going to hold on tight. I like to live on the edge. We'll go as fast as they'll go. And um, yes, both Marriott's are actually booked already. So one, um, one of the uh, is at Colorado, not Colorado state. That would be a hell of a drive on a, a golf cart at Columbus State, and the other one is in at Troy as a new location across the bridge, so in Alabama, Phoenix City. So we'll be driving. It's walkable. It's half a mile otherwise, right? 
That's not so, bad. <coughs> no, no. I mean, unless it's raining, it's not going to be a problem anyway. But Umbrella? so we'll be shuttling people. But so I am not going to be able to spend much time with Tara on that day. And so I'm going to we're going to go to lunch for sure. Yeah, we'll bring our walking sticks. I don't <laughs> think we'll need them there. But um, there's not a lot of drop downs. I'm not that short. The curbs are not scary that much to me. Um, but I'm hoping that I can uh, uh, get a bunch of little notes and then have different people give them to Tara at different times of the day because I won't be able to see her. And then because dinner is going to be kind of sucky because I'm not going to be able to go to dinner that night. Anyway. I'll make sure she's okay, too. Okay. But I don't want her to feel like left out, you know. And I'm sure end. she'll understand. Anyway, so I think. Uh, thank you, Vicki, for being on here today. Uh, I know Matt, Thanks he'll be there. Um, yeah, it does take a village for a birthday. So I, wouldn't that be a cool little idea? Like have a bunch of little notes or maybe I'll get her some flowers or something. I don't know what I could do. A plant. That'd probably be terrible because then she'd have to carry it to Colorado. So plant's not a good idea. Fireworks. Oh, yeah, she will have fireworks for her birthday, which will be super fun. And I'll tell you, it's all for her. So Matt will be there. But then there's also a Bible study on um, Sunday morning at 10, which is open to everybody. And I'm excited for you guys to come to that, too. Cool. Well, thanks, Diane. This has been fun. And it was great meeting all of y'all. And I look forward to seeing you at Creative South, hopefully. <coughs> yeah. So um, anyway, thank you, Vicki. And um, I'll talk to you later. And I love you. And love have you a too. you're the only person I've ever told I loved on my show. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. <laughs> probably. Anyway, thank you guys and um, help me with my project for Tara. So and next week, just so you know, I have Rusty Mitchell, who is UX UI guy, and he always comes to create. Ooh, love those saying bye. Yes. Um, and he's always comes to Creative South also. And I went to grad school with him. So you'll get to meet Rusty, Vicky. So oh, that'll be good. Cool. He's in Tennessee. You want to show him Ludlow? Yeah. We really are dog people. Hey, Ludlow. He can't hear me because you have the earbuds. Yep. Anyway, have a good day. Bye, y'all. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks. Bye, y'all.